Time for convening having arrived. The Senate will come to order with ask unauthorized visitors to exit chamber at this time. And the Senate will come to order. Chair recognizes the distinguished senator from the 53rd. Good morning, Mr. President. Here on the 38th legislative day, the magic day, the journal's been read and found to be correct. 38th day. Thank you, Senator, for your good works on the journal. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading of the journal? Reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none and the journal is confirmed. All senators having bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. First reading in reference of Senate bills and resolutions. <clears throat> Senate Bill 265 by Senators Crane of the 28th and others. A bill to Regulated the industries. Senate Resolution 629 by Senators McCoon of the 29th and others. A resolution encouraging. Rules Committee. Through with the order, Mr. President. First reading in reference of House bills and resolutions. House Bill 609 by Representative Rogers of the 10th and others. Slogo. House Bill 613 by Representative Henson of the 86th and others. Slogo. House Bill 614 by Representative Jacobs of the 80th and others. Slogo. House Bill 616 by Representative Morris of the 156th. A bill to be entitled an act. Slogo. House Bill 619 by Representative Oliver of the 82nd and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend an act creating a new charter for the Slogo. city. Slogo. House Bill 620 by Representative Rice of the 95th and others. A bill Slogo. House Bill 622 by Representative Green of the 151st. A bill to be entitled an act to amend an Slogo. act. Slogo. House Bill 623 by Representative Benton of the 31st. A bill to be entitled an act to create Slogo. the- Slogo. House Bill 624 by Representative Green of the 151st. A Slogo. House Bill 625 by Representative Hitchens of the 161st. Slogo. House Bill 626 by Representative Channel of the- Slogo. House Bill 627 by Representative Jones of the 47th and others. A Slogo. House Bill 628 by Representative Neal of the 2nd and State others. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 629 by Representative Gregory of the 34th and others. A bill to be entitled. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 630 by Representative Kelly of the 16th and others. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 631 by Representative Kelly of the 16th. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 632 by Representative Duke of State the. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 634 by Representative Wilkerson of the 38th and others. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 635 by Representative Pruitt of the 149th. A bill to be State and local governmental operations. House Bill 636 by Representative Pruitt of the 149th. A bill to be entitled an act to amend State and local governmental operations. House Bill 638 by Representative Earhart of the 36th and others. A bill State and local governmental operations. House Bill 639 by Representative Mitchell of the 88th and others. A bill to be entitled State and local governmental operations. House Bill 641 by Representative Parsons of the 44th and others. State and local governmental operations. House Bill 642 by Representative Jacobs of the 80th and others. State and local governmental operations. Through with the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read reports of standing committees. Mr. President, the Senate Judiciary Committee has had into consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. That House Bill 182 do pass by substitute. That House Bill 215 do pass. That House Bill 382 do pass by substitute. That House Bill 499 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator McCoon of the 29th Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. That House Bill 517 do pass by substitute. That House Bill 132 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Murphy, the 27th Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Rules Committee has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. That Senate Resolution 594 do pass by substitute. That Senate Resolution 597 do pass. That Senate Resolution 598 do pass. That House Bill 143 do pass by substitute. That Senate Resolution 203 pursuant to Senate Rule 2-1.10B referred by the Senate Rules Committee to Senate Rules Committee from the General Calendar. Respectfully submitted, Senator Mellis of the 53rd Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate State and Local Governmental Operations Committee has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. That Senate Bill 254 do pass. That Senate Bill 256 do pass. That Senate Bill 257 do pass. That Senate Bill 258 do pass. That Senate Bill 259 do pass. That House Bill 233 do pass. That House Bill 485 do pass. That House Bill 568 do pass. That House Bill 572 do pass. That House Bill 577 do pass. That House Bill 583 do pass by substitute. That House Bill 585 do pass. That House Bill 587 do pass. That House Bill 592 do pass. That House Bill 598 do pass. That House Bill 600 do pass. That House Bill 602 do pass. That House Bill 514 do pass by substitute. That House Bill 596 do pass. That House Bill 635 do pass. That House Bill 636 do pass. That House Bill 526 do pass. That House Bill 613 do pass. That House Bill 639 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Legan of the Third, Chairman. Through with the order, Mr. President.
Second readers. Senate Resolution 594 by Senator Loudermichel, 14th, and others. Taxpayer Protection Amendment of 2011. Provide for limitations on state government taxation expenditures. Senate Resolution 597 by Senator Hill, 32nd, and others. Georgia Program Integrity Senate Study Committee. Create. Senate Resolution 598 by Senator Hill, of the 6th, and others. Senate Public-Private Partnership Study Committee, create. House Bill 132 by Representative Hawkins of the 27th and others. Georgia Board of Pharmacy and Georgia Board of Dentistry, administratively attached to Department of Community Health, provide. House Bill 143 by Representative Ralston of the 7th and others. Campaign contributions, disclosure reports, change certain provisions. House Bill 182 by Representative Weldon of the 3rd and others. Juvenile Court Administration, hearing on the order of an associate court judge, delete provisions. House Bill 215 by Representative Benton of the 31st. Superior Courts, filings in the clerk's office, change provisions. House Bill 382 by Representative Powell of the 171st and others. Torts, governing authority of school that enters into recreational joint use agreement with public or private entity, limit liability. House Bill 499 by Representative Sheldon of the 104th and others. Torts, payer guidelines and criteria under federal law shall not establish legal basis for negligence or standard of care for medical malpractice provide. House Bill 517 by Representative Williams of the 119th and others. Alcohol, local control of distance requirements of grocery stores and other licensees for retail sale of wine and malt beverages near college campuses provide. Through with the order, Mr. President. It is now time for the morning roll call. Time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Chair recognize Senator from the 54th. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 23rd for business outside the chamber. 23rd, without objection, Senator from the 23rd will be excused. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 34th. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 22nd. He is en route. 22nd, without objection, the senator will be excused. Are there any other motions to excuse? Chair recognizes the senator on the 41st. No, Secretary will call the roll of senators. Please signify your presence by voting the yay switch. The secretary will unlock the machine. <laughs> Senator from the 43rd, 43rd approach, please.
It's uh, now time for our morning devotion. Would ask that senators please take your seats and cease conversation at this time. It is now my distinct honor to recognize uh, the very distinguished senator from the 27th for the purpose of leading us in our pledge and introducing our chaplain of the day. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the pledge to the Georgia flag. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag and the principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, and moderation. Well, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, introduce the pastor of the day, uh, who is my pastor, Father Keith Oglesby. Uh, Keith is one of the rare breed around Atlanta. He was actually born in Atlanta at Crawford Long Hospital. Married to his wife, Lynn, who is also Atlanta native, and they've been married for 33 years. They have three children, Lauren, Will, and Catherine. Uh, Keith has a 24-year business career before he uh, became a, uh, a priest. He was with, the, um, with FedEx, Delta, and GE. Uh, and with FedEx, I guarantee you, he wasn't a castaway uh, with FedEx, but uh, he, is, uh, he has a business mind uh, and a business career as his background, which is sometimes unusual for a, uh, for a priest. Um, he graduated from the Candler School of Theology at Emory University in, in 2007. He served uh, his first uh, two years in the ministry of St. Aidens in, in Alpharetta. He has served as rector of the Holy Spirit and Coming, which is uh, my uh, church, for almost four years since 2009. Please welcome our pastor today, Keith Oglesby. Thank you, Senator Murphy and Lieutenant Governor Cagle. I'm honored to be the chaplain of the day again. I've actually done it two other times, and it's a real privilege to speak to you and give you a short message. They told me to keep it under 30 minutes, so we'll work on that. Uh, but as we begin, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin with a reading from Scripture. It's from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. And God said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. This passage is about the prophet Elijah, and if you're not familiar with his story, Elijah had been a very busy and a very effective public servant. He was really a reformer. He had challenged injustice, and he'd done it so well, he'd made a lot of powerful people angry. They became so angry that they wanted to kill Elijah. So he got out of town. He went on a retreat up in the mountains, and during this time away, Elijah complained to God about how he's being mistreated after he'd done all this good. And that's when God told Elijah to go outside and to pay attention. And what he found out is that in the midst of many distractions, God was still able to speak to him in a still, small voice. So how do you listen for God's voice in the midst of the distractions of your daily life? And how do you do it especially when you have to make such important decisions in your role as senators. As leaders, there are many forces that attempt to influence your decisions. They may not be as distracting as what Elijah faced, a windstorm, an earthquake, a fire. But those forces that you face can still make it hard to hear that still, small voice of God. 
as you struggle to decide the right thing to do. And probably the most common voice you hear is from your constituents, and listening to us is important. But I imagine not every constituent's voice is equally helpful. I was listening to the radio the other day, and I heard someone come on and say, I know how to fix things in Washington. In fact, this person said, I've written a 30-point manifesto on my blog. And they went on to say that my first point is to stop sending any money to Washington. Well, that may be well intended, but it's not particularly helpful. And I imagine as senators, you hear from a lot of good, helpful constituents and then some that aren't so helpful. Listening to our voices is not enough. Another voice you hear is just from all of your experience, your education, especially your experience as legislators. And that's an important voice to listen to, so to speak. All those forces have shaped you into the men and women that we chose to represent us. But no matter how knowledgeable you might be because of all your experience and education, it's not enough. Each one of us is limited in what we know. And so what you do as responsible leaders is you have assistants that do research, you have people who are experts to testify, and that's important. But I'm sure you found that at the end of some long days, that's still not enough, that something is missing. So when that happens, what do you do? Well, when all of that falls short, your constituents, your expertise, many of us will turn to, judge, to conscience to decide. And as a minister, I would never tell anyone to not listen to your conscience. But I would offer a caution about conscience. It's not perfect. It, too, is formed by forces in society, the state, the media, the church, our families. And those, as important as they are, are still not perfect. Leaders in the Jim Crow South were following their conscience as they enforced unjust laws. So what do you do? What voice do you listen to when all these other voices aren't enough? Because I imagine in these next few days you're going to have some tough decisions. And I wouldn't presume to tell you what you need to do on any specific issue. But when you face a tough choice, what I would advise you to do, after you've listened to all the voices and after you've faced all the stormy distractions, I encourage each of you to find time to be quiet, to listen for that still, small voice that Elijah heard. For it's in that voice that you'll find wisdom and in that voice that you'll find courage to do what you need to do, no matter what you might face. Let us pray. O God, the fountain of wisdom, whose will is good and gracious, and whose law is truth, we beseech thee so to guide and bless our senators and the legislature of the state, that they may enact such laws as shall please thee, to the glory of thy name and the welfare of thy people. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well done, as All right. always. Thank you. That Thank very you. Much.
Secretary will read a resolution. Senate Resolution 565 by Senator Ramsey of the 43rd. A resolution congratulating the Miller Grove High School varsity boys basketball team on winning their fifth consecutive state championship and for other purposes. Whereas for the fifth time in their brief nine year history, the Miller Grove High School varsity boys basketball team earned the top ranking in the state through insistence, fortitude, and perseverance and by defeating Gainesville High School with a score of 61 to 57. And whereas after becoming the first and only team in Georgia to win four consecutive titles in class 4A, the team moved up to class 5A only to win their first year in the new classification. Whereas the team's stellar season was achieved due to the due to the astute direction of head coach Sharman White, assistant coaches Timothy Britt, Rasul Chester, LaShawn Reeves, Mason Ambler, and Derek Robinson. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body congratulate Miller Grove High School varsity boys basketball team on winning their fifth consecutive state championship in both Class 4A and Class 5A and extend their sincere best wishes for future success. Through with the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to adoption of the resolution? The chair is none. The resolution is adopted. To speak to the resolution and recognize these Wonderful champions, I call upon the distinguished senator from the 43rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. It is my honor and privilege to introduce you to the mighty Wolverines of Miller Grove High School. These young men under the tutelage of Coach Charman White have won not one, not two, not three, not four, but five consecutive 5A state championships. So I have the captains up here with me. The rest of the team is in the stands. Please stand and ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, help me welcome them and congratulate them on a wonderful feat. Thank you, and it's truly an honor to be recognized uh, by Rep uh, State Senator Ramsey. And I just want to let you know how proud I am these young men and women who've put forth the dedication to be able to put themselves in the annals of Georgia high school basketball history by being the first team to ever uh, score five straight state championships, a record that will be on the books we feel like forever. But it all is a credit to them and their hard work and dedication. And they're not just athletes, they're student athletes. And they do it in the classroom as well as they do it on the floor. So I'm very extremely proud to be up here uh, to say this in front of you. And thank you for having us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any unanimous consents? Is Senator one or any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Chair recognize Senator from 38th. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. Um, when I walk down here and don't have anything, so I don't think I ever walk down here and don't have any notes, basically, uh, I wanted to mention what happened Friday at the end of the day on House Resolution 73. We got to the end of the calendar, as you are aware, and we adjourned. And we adjourned on a bill that didn't make it out um, last year that we went through last year, passed it out of this body, passed out of the House first, and then in the waning hours um, of our session on the 40th day, they were not able to get it out because of a minor change that we made in the Senate. This is a compensation resolution for a person who was wrongfully imprisoned because he had incompetent legal representation. He went to jail for 10 years, 11 months. On the appeal, um, when, when the judge just said, your lawyer didn't do an adequate job of representing you. The person who said he was the one that robbed the store is in jail for having killed someone. And he said, I lied. I didn't tell the truth when I pointed out this young man. This young man was on his way to the Marines in six days when he, was, when, he, when he found out that they were looking for him and he went down to the um, police department and they locked him up, said that he had, he actually robbed somebody that he didn't do. 
he did the right thing. He was trying to clear it up. And we throw him in jail. Of course, more complicated than that. But he goes to jail on the testimony of someone that was lying. So yes, needless to say, I was concerned on Friday that we get to that point on our calendar and we can't take up this piece of legislation. As I said to you on Friday, if it was your child, your cousin, somebody that you knew, you wouldn't want to put them through this for two years straight. That is not the way that this deliberative body should be handling our business. And I felt like it was an opportunity this morning that I wanted to share that with you because I think some people said, if you don't get the bill now, it's my fault because of the way I acted. I was passionate. This man is not a constituent of mine. He's just been wronged, and we need to correct it. And so I just made, wanted you, everyone in this body, to understand that you're playing with this man's life that he's already given up 10 years, 11 months for. He could have been in the military doing what you would want your child to do, have a good life, and he instead had to go to jail, and then we play games with this man's life. I don't think that's what we're here for. Thank you. Mr. President and colleagues for indulging me. Would like uh, to present the doctor of the day and to do so I call upon the distinguished senator from the 42nd. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my great honor to introduce again uh, Dr. Patty Schiff who uh, has served as the doctor of the day on several occasions. She also lives right around the corner from me and when I took the training wheels off my child's bike this weekend. I was good, glad to know that Dr. Schiff was three doors down. <laughs> um, she uh, has a very distinguished <clears throat> medical career, but well, the one thing I'll mention as she's come here several years in a row now is that last year she was going to go to Antarctica as the um, as the uh, ship physician with the National Geographic Expedition. That trip was successful. She went, she's back, and uh, we're all glad to see her. So thank you so much, Dr. Schiff. Well, I don't have much to say except to have a very safe and productive day, but I also remind you, uh, since we've already had a very busy morning, to wash your hands and use the hand sanitizer. And thank you very much for your hard work. Chair recognized Senator from the 47th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you know, a lot of our members here know I've spent a lot of time in local government, and we all try to work hard for the taxpayers, and we do a lot of things to improve things for our citizens, but I can't think of a guy that's had a bigger influence in a small city in North Gwinnett County, the city of Sugar Hill, the, uh, than our Honorable Mayor Gary Perkle, who's here today the, uh, as, as my friend and, and, and uh, former uh, the, uh, compadre in the city of Sugar Hill, but he has with him his lovely bride Allison and his two children, which I should say that Gary is the sugar daddy of Sugar Hill. If you have been watching that news lately, and I'm not sure where we're headed to with the city of Sugar Hill, maybe going to the, the city of sugardaddy.com, but they uh, wanted to welcome the, the mayor and his family here the, uh, this morning and would ask that we give them a big round of applause. You, we have a consent calendar of privileged resolutions that are before you. Is there objection to agreeing to the report um, on the consent calendar? Chair hears none, and the resolutions are therefore adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw or commit? Mr. Secretary, are there any objections filed on any of the bills on local consent calendar? Mr. President, there are no objections filed in the Secretary's office.
Is there objection to agreeing to the report on the Committee of State and Local Governmental Operations, which Farrell passed the bill? Chair hears none. All those in favor of the local consent calendar will vote aye. Those opposed, no. And the Secretary will unlock the machine. <laughs> Voting on the local consent calendar. We're about to move to the general calendar. Chair, recognize Senator 38th. President, and looking at the low consent calendar, I see that we have on House Bill 639, Jones of the 25th. I think it should be Jones of the 10th. I just wanted to make sure we had that corrected. That will, uh, the Secretary said that he will change the uh, number. Uh, the bill is right. It's just uh, evidently uh, the Senator's number was incorrect. On the local consent calendar, the yeas are 45 and the nays are zero. And this, these bills have received Rex Constitution majority are therefore adopted. <laughs> Chair recognizes Senator from the 17th, 17th. President, I want to move to engross House Bill 210. 210, there is objection. All those in favor? You wish to debate? Nope. All those in favor of engrossment of House Bill 210 will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Uh -huh. Okay. Finance bill. It's a finance bill. The motion for engrossment, the yeas are 33, nays are 13, and House Bill 210 has been engrossed. Chair recognize Senator from the 8th. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that we engross House Bill 193. W 193. Is there objection? There is objection. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Another finance bill, a House Bill 193, being moved on engrossment.
On the motion for engrossment, the yeas are 33 and the nays are 13, and the motion for engrossment has uh, passed. Chair, recognize Senator Sen from the 33rd. What purpose you rise? Follow the inquiry, Mr. President. State your inquiry. In no way would I ever uh, take it upon myself to try to correct the Lieutenant Governor, but I would ask you, uh, both of those bills were tax bills, is it not true? That is correct. And there are finance bills that are not tax bills. Uh, that's true. And if you would differentiate between those, I'd appreciate it. But isn't it yep. true? I've always favored engrossing tax sure. bills. Yeah, yeah, tax bills. That's exactly right. Chair, recognize Senator on the 50th. Mr. President, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to engross House Bill 304. 304 on the calendar. Is there objection? Without objection, the tax bill will be engrossed. Moving on to the general calendar. Secretary will read House Bill 36. 36. House Bill 36 by Representative Watson on the 166th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 27-1-2 of the OCGA relating to game and fish definitions so as to revise the definition of game fish and for their purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Natural Resources and the Environment recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President. <laughs> Chair recognizes the Senator from the first present the bill. Please give the Senator your attention. Thank you, Mr. President. Senators, I bring before you today House Bill 36. This is a bill that will make Red Drum the, a game fish. For those of you who are not aware, Red Drum is the official saltwater fish of the state of Georgia, and by making it a game fish, we'll be able to control and hopefully make sure that these fish are around for years to come. Just um, real quickly, I want to share with you, for someone like myself who grew up on the Georgia coast, some of my fondest memories are of going fishing with my dad and catching red drum, or as we refer to them as spot-tailed bass. And I can remember going, and, and they were just plentiful. And we want to make sure that that continues. I want to make sure that my sons and my grandsons are going to have this opportunity, the same opportunity that I had, and this will help us in doing that, and this will help us in controlling the stock to make sure that they're there for years to come. Mr. President, if there are no questions, I would ask for the support of House Bill 36. You do have a question, Chair and I, Senator from the second. Gentleman in the first, do you yield, sir? I yield. If this should pass in this, in this form, sir, wouldn't it exclude local fishermen from being able to sell the spotted tail bass to their local uh, markets? Well, it, if this bill does pass, what it does is to simply make it a game fish so that they can't be bought and sold. Right now, there are very few of these fish being sold in the market, so the impact that it would have on the fisheries, on the, on the marketplace, would be nominal. Okay. Do the gentleman further yield? Yes, sir. Sir, I, I represent a district that is filled with local seafood markets, and they depend on this spotted tail bass to sell to their retailers, such as Russo, uh, Russo Seafoods, uh, Charlie's Seaf Seafood, uh, on and on, Teeple's Market, and they depend on the resale of these spotted tail bass. And they were wondering if they could have just 10% to sell to re local retailers. Senator, I would say that, first of all, last year there were only 500 pounds of these fish sold. Again, the amount that's being sold on the market is negligible. And, and most of what we're finding is it's on the black market that's being sold. So I would, be, I would be opposed to any amendment. This is the way that we should go. It passed in the House this way, and, and hopefully it'll pass in the Senate this way. Chair, recognize Senator on the 19th. Senator Yield. I yield. Senator, isn't it true that they can buy redfish that's commercially grown? 
Yes, sir, that is true, and thank you for that point. They are commercially grown in Texas, and they are, you can buy the um, redfish from North Carolina as well. Uh, no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, I would ask for your support of House Bill 36. Chair, and I, Senator, I'm the second. Good morning, gentlemen and ladies of the Senate. While I applaud the gentleman of the first you know, of protecting a species of fish, I would like to say that House Bill 36 is a, is a bill this morning that needs further debate and further discussion. What we have here, if we exclude local fishermen from being, being able to sell this fish, we stop local entrepreneurs from being able to sell or, or participate in their craft. The spotted, the, the spotted tail bass, some of you may not think of it as a, as a big deal, but the spotted, the spotted tail bass can also be you know, called the black sea bass or channel bass or, or red snapper. All these things are, are red drums. But what we have in the district where I represent are local, a lot of many local commercial fishermen, and I'm sure the senator from the third, the senator from the fourth also have these local sea markets, and they sell spotted tail bass because our community eat a lot of spotted tail bass. And this should pass, and we should call it a game fish. They would no longer be able to fish for this item or be able to re or sell this item. So I, I encourage this body to vote against this bill. Let's have it for more, dis more discussion. Let's have the opportunity for everybody to participate and be able to sell fish. Yeah. You got to understand, members, what we're doing is, in, is to, by definition, we are adding redfish as a game fish. I'm sure the game fish, this red fish will not go extinct in one year, but by calling it a game fish, we will no longer be able to fish locally and be able to sell it locally. And you will not put them out of business, but you will put a, a, a restriction on a lot of local fish markets that they have never had and, be able to, and, and it will drastically affect the retailers, the local retailers on the coast and consumers in our area. Thank you. If there be no questions, are there a question? The gentleman of the world recognizes the gentleman from the 33rd. <laughs> Chair, and I, Senator from 34th for a question. Will the Senator yield? Yes, ma'am. Senator, are the uh, red drum kin to wide mouth bass? A distant cousin. Distant cousin. Thank you. Not, a, not in the same species, but, but they are more of a. You see these, fishes, these fish grow from 14 inches to 50 pounds. And, and at 14 inches, they are a good fishy product for our local uh, for, for, for our locals and they eat it and we really enjoy it. Are there any other questions? The gentleman recognized Chair recognized Senator from thirty third for a question. The Senator to you. Yes sir. Senator now it it doesn't help our local fishermen if we're buying these fish in North Carolina and Texas, does it? No, sir. So it, that example is not a good one as far as what's good for the local fishermen in Georgia. Is that right? Well, and you're absolutely correct, sir. But what it does is if local fishermen can't fish these fish, then we'll force to buy them from North Carolina and Virginia and then sell them locally. And what it's, what it's doing is, is restricting our local fishermen to sell a product that, that, that they've been doing their entire lives, their entire family lives. I understand. Right. And why should we put this restriction for on Georgia fishermen when, when the South Carolina fishermen, the North Carolina fishermen, and the Virginia fishermen don't have the same 
restrictions. So once again, I'm asking that you vote against House Bill 36, and let's go back to the table and revisit this issue. Chair, recognize Senator from the first. The Senator Gill. Yes, sir. Senator, you just made an erroneous statement. I want to give you the opportunity to correct it. Mm -hmm. You just said that South Carolina and Florida. I didn't are say Florida. You said just, South Carolina. I said that is erroneous. South Carolina and Florida have adopted them as game fish as well. North Carolina and Virginia has not. You said South Carolina. Just want to make sure I understood you. North Carolina and Virginia have have not, and they sell these fishes in Georgia. If this should pass, then they would be, be permitted to same sell these fish in Georgia. If there be no further questions, I urge you to vote against House Bill 36, and let's go back to the table and let our local fishermen do what they've been doing their entire lives. Thank you. Mr. President, if there be no further questions, I yield the will. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed in the Porter Committee which failed pass the bill? Chairs none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none. Main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? Questions on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed no. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 38 and the nays are 12. This bill, having to see Rex Constitution majority, is therefore adopted. Secretary will read House Bill 45. House Bill 45 by Representative Earhart of the 36th. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 16 of Title 50 of the OCGA relating to general provisions relative to public property so as to change certain provisions relating to writing off small amounts due to the state and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Appropriations recommends that this bill do pass. Amendment 1. Senator McCoon of the 29th offers the following amendment. Amend House Bill 45 by inserting the following after due to the state on line 3. To amend Code Section 50-3-54 of the OCGA relating to state wildflower so as to designate the native azalea as the state wildflower and for other purposes. Through with the order, Mr. President. Question, uh, Chair recognizes Senator from the 18th. Present the bill. Please give the distinguished majority whip your attention. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. I'm pleased to present to you and ask for your support for House Bill 45. This bill uh, is a reauthorization due to sunset provisions uh, of a bill that was originally passed back in 2003. It was continued during 2006 and 2008 and 2010 sessions. Uh, this is a bill which allows the technical college system as well as the university system uh, institutions to carry forward fund balances at the end of the year. This has been very important to them as they have weathered the economic downturn and budget cuts over recent years. And it is good business practice because it uh, does away with 
uh, the practice or the incentive at least for managers to spend money at the end of the physical year, sort of a use it or lose it uh, philosophy. So this is good uh, common sense legislation. I urge you to pass this. It's very important for the technical college system and the Board of Regents. Uh, there is an amendment on your desk uh, which someone else will speak to, uh, but at this time uh, I would ask you to pass this bill clean because if we pass it here today it will go to the governor for his signature and this will again be of great help to the technical college system and the university system. Mr. President, I'll be glad to yield for questions if there are any. There are no questions, Senator. Did you speak to the amendment? I did, uh, and I would ask you uh, not to uh, adopt this amendment, which has to do no. with an azalea as the state's uh, wildflower. While I'm certainly in support of that, I don't believe this bill is the appropriate venue for that. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Chair, recognize Senator of 29th. President, I'd, I'd just like to withdraw the amendment. Withdraw the amendment. The Senator is moving to withdraw the amendment. Unanimous consent. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendment has been withdrawn. Now, does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to agree in the Porter Committee which failed to pass the bill? Chairs, none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none, and the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? The question is on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Let me have the Senate's attention for just uh, one moment, if I might. Um, I know everyone's real busy, but we have had an individual that has been uh, around the Capitol for a long, long time. You normally don't get to see him on TV, but he makes everybody look a little bit better. That's Ira Spratlin, who is here, and 37 years with Fox 5, and I think he's about to call it quits. But let's give him a great round of applause. What a great man, what a great job he's done. Well, I always wanted to do this, get in front of the Senate. Uh, I have a, a bill. I have a I have a simple bill to hurt no elderly, <laughs> women or children, just a simple bill. Housekeeping. Good, good housekeeping bill. <laughs> that's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah, but uh, but I've, in, I've, in, I've enjoyed it uh, over the years. And, and the Senate, I've uh, seen some great speakers, orators. Uh, Culver Kidd, uh, uh, you yeah, ever saw him in here years ago? He was quite a character. And uh, but uh, I respect you guys. Uh, I grew up in a small community in Merriweather County. Uh, my father was involved in local politics, and that was politics talked all the time. And uh, so when I started with Channel Five, I said I wanted to cover <laughs> politics and. And, and I've enjoyed it, 37 years of covering you. Appreciate it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. I Good to see you. We're going to make you guys. Okay. Thank you.
On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 50, the nays are zero. And this bill, having a Rex Constitution majority, is therefore adopted. Secretary is going to read House Bill 83. House Bill 83 by Representative Knight of the 130th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 13 of Chapter 1 of Title 7 of the OCGA relating to licensing of mortgage lenders and mortgage brokers and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Regulated Industries and Utilities recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 29th to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my privilege to present to you House Bill 83. Uh, under current state law, uh, the banking department has interpreted uh, current state law to say that realtors cannot provide information to a lender in a short sale transaction unless they are, in fact, a licensed mortgage loan originator. HB 83 will correct this uh, issue within the law. Uh, it will allow realtors to provide information to a lender and facilitate short sale transactions without risk of violating the interpretation of current law. Of course, as many of you know, short sale transactions are extremely common in today's market. And if we were unable to uh, move on House Bill 83, uh, the net result would be many realtors withdrawing from short sale transactions, making those more difficult uh, to conclude. Uh, House Bill 83 is supported by the Georgia Association of Realtors, the Banking Department, and the Mortgage Bankers Association. If there are no questions, Mr. President, I'll yield the well. No further questions, Senator. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed? The Port of Committee which favor pass the bill. The chair is none. Port of Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none, and the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? The question is on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. The secretary will unlock the machine. Chair, uh, on the pass of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero, and this bill, I'm C. Rex Constitution majority, is therefore passed. Secretary Reed, House Bill 115. House Bill 115 by Representative Dixon of the Sixth and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 3 of Chapter 2 of Title 20 of the OCGA relating to local boards of education so as to revise pr provisions relating to suspension and removal of local school board members and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Education and Youth recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. The Education and Youth Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 115. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 20 of the OCGA relating to education so as to pr revise provisions relating to suspension and removal of local school board members upon potential loss of accreditation and for other purposes. Amendment 1. Senator Ford of the 39th and others offer the following amendment. I amend the Senate Education and Youth Committee substitute to House Bill 115 by inserting after conditions on line 5 the following. To provide restrictions on remediation to attain full accreditation and for other purposes. Through the order, Mr. President. Chair recognizes Senator from the 37th present the bill.
Thank you, Mr. President, fellow senators and guests in the chamber. I bring, it's my pleasure to bring to you House Bill 115. This is an education bill. This deals with school districts that are in danger of losing their accreditation. Summation of the bill has got five points. The first being local boards of education are required to give the state Board of Education written notice within three business days of being placed on the level of accreditation immediately preceding loss of accreditation. This is known as probation. Extends the time period for which the Board of Education can conduct a hearing uh, upon the notification from 30 days to 90 days. Allows the post-hearing deliberations of the BOE uh, to be held in executive session or close to the public, but any actions that they take would be public. Also prohibits local boards of education from expending public funds on attorney's fees and litigation expenses related to the proceedings initiated after the removal of such board members uh, in, in the legally prescribed manner. And lastly, it amends the definition of eligible high school as it relates to the HOPE scholarship to allow students graduating from a previously accredited high school to still be eligible for the HOPE scholarship. Mr. President, if there are no questions, I yield the will. There is a question. Chair recognizes Senator from the 42nd. You wish to speak or question? Speak. Senator from the 33rd has a question. Senator Yu. Yes, Senator sir. Yu. Mr. Chairman, let me ask you. And, and this may be current law. I'm not familiar with, with the operations of local boards as opposed to the state board of education, does this give the governor uh, the, uh, the authority to suspend the entire board uh, under these circumstances? Well, the procedure on this, if the board is notified that they are, the local board is notified they're on probation, they would be required within three business days to notify the state board of education, who in turn would have hearings within 90 days to determine a recommendation that would go to the governor as it relates to the board, specifically at individual members or the board as a whole. And so it could go to the entire board if the entire board uh, through the hearing process was determined to be at fault as, a, as the precipitating cause of the loss of accreditation. Further yield. One, one more question. Yes, sir. Are you? Uh, I, what I guess I'm asking is it said there's a provision in here, and I just saw it this morning, that says the board, uh, that he can suspend the entire board with pay. I'm sorry, Senator. I cannot hear you even though you're standing within six feet of me. I think we can now. Do you yield, sir? Yes, yes sir. There is a provision. <clears throat> where it says that the governor can suspend uh, the entire board with pay uh, listed here, unless it's not in the sub. Is this a substitute? No, this is just a bill. There is that provision in there, and my question is, can he suspend them before the State Board of Education gives him a recommendation uh, or no. his pleasure? He has, to wait on the, he has to wait on the report. His actions would come after the deliberations of the State Board of Education. Thank you. Yes, sir. Chair, recognize Senator from the 39th for a question. Will the Senator yield? Absolutely. Uh, I just have a couple of questions for my own edification, which may help our colleagues. Presently, the testimony at one of these hearings is, is public. Is that not correct? Would you repeat your question? At present, regarding these hearings, the testimony that is offered um, is, is public testimony. Is that not correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. If Senator further yield? I will. Now, presently, are the deliberations of the board open to the public? I believe they are. Will Senator further yield? Yes, sir. This is a administ is this an administrative hearing? What? How would you characterize that? I know it's not a trial, but it, is it an administrative hearing or is it something else? It would be an administrative hearing, but I think the I think the beauty of having the uh, deliberations closed 
is I believe that it would be in more fairness to the board members, of the local board members, to have that testimony. After, after the hearings are concluded, the, their findings would be made public and any, de, any deliberations, or not deliberations, but any actions taken would be, have to be voted on in public and they'd have to have supporting documentation. But I, I think people are in a position, if they're brought before a board, they could have damage done to their reputations if there were charges that had been made that were not valid. Well, the Senator further yield for yes, a final question. So it's your, and, I, and I'm not, as I stand here, convinced one way or the other, but it's your um, belief that a closed deliberation would provide more fairness and equity for the board members who- It would, uh, it would function in the same manner of an executive session hearing of an employee to protect their rights until the board finds sufficient reason to take public action. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 26th for a question. Let me, before, before you speak, <clears throat> let me make sure, um, just as a reminder to everyone, a lot of people are on the floor, uh, a lot of activity going on. Your conversations need to be had in the ante room. Um, there's going to be a lot of debate that's uh, ensuing on the floor today, I'm sure. So let's be respectful of senators that are wishing uh, to debate in the body and take your conversations to the ante room. Chair, recognize Senator from 26 for a question. Would the Senator yield? Yes, sir. Senator, uh, isn't it also, is it not true that in this particular substitute as well as the bill that no monies can be expended from the, the Board of Education itself in defending the board members? That's only after their removal has taken place up, to, up until the point of time that the governor would suspend them. They have the right to representation by county funds. With the, gentleman, the, the senator earlier. Yes, sir. Senator, how does it affect uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act if members are elected and all of a sudden uh, uh, suspended by the governor and then he appoints someone? I have no comment on that. I'm not an expert on the voter right bill, sir. Well, do you, uh, with the senator further year? Absolutely. Uh, do you think there needs to be some clarification in, in this substitute as well as to whether or not this needs to be submitted if passed, need to be submitted to the Justice Department in order for the appointment of suspended board members and the appointment of other folks to serve in, the, in the, those board members' place? I'm sure the senator knows of which he speaks. No further questions, Senator. Thank you, sir. Chair recognizes Senator from the 42nd to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. I represent three school districts in my district. I represent the City of Atlanta Schools, the DeKalb County Schools, and the City of Decatur Schools. One of those is one of the best run school districts in the state. Uh, it's a charter system. Uh, it gets a great number of benefits from being independent of some of the State Board of Elections issues, and, and, and it's to be commended. The other two have both been the subject of this bill. And the problem with the policy as it stands today is that it focuses exclusively on who is on the board. And it converts every single educational accreditation issue, first and foremost, into a political issue. And I believe that we have to have a serious discussion and, an, uh, and, and a revision of the law. Because I'll tell you, in DeKalb County and in the Atlanta Public Schools, as soon as you decide that the governor's only option is to remove the board members, it becomes a question of who is on the board and not 
What are they doing? What's the issues in the school? What are the educational outcomes we're looking for? What's going on with the students? What's going on with the teachers? The issues that we need to be focusing on in crisis is reduced to who is on the board. Sometimes that might be an issue. Sometimes that might be the biggest problem, but it's certainly not true all the time. And I know um, that, that the governor's office believes that they need uh, a, a much finer instrument than the bludgeon of removal as the only option. And so I, I, I rise today to say that, that, that this bill tweaks the law, but it maintains the current law as solely about who's on the board. And, and the bottom line is this, the purpose of this law cannot be that you want to punish the people who are on the school board when this stuff happens. It can't be punitive towards the school board. It has to be forward-looking for the benefit of the students in that district. And I think that this particular piece of legislation, while it does tweak the, 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 the current law, it needs to be the, the, the current law that allows removal has to be broadly redefined and really analyzed to ensure that we can refine the state's role in these contexts because right now we're not doing a good job of it. We're maintaining this single political issue of who is on the board and it's not healthy. It's not healthy for the community. It's almost inherently divisive. It's inherently undemocratic to go in and say we're going to remove you as the only option and, and, and I don't think anyone is satisfied with the current legislation. We're going to drop a piece of legislation in the next few days that will be a comp comprehensive reimagining essentially of what the governor's powers would be in the event of a school board coming on probation. So, and it will be, it will involve a variety of options, a menu of options for the governor rather than just removal. I think it will be a much healthier, a much more robust discussion about how this law needs to look. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to recognize that because right now the system is broken. Nobody likes it. And, and this this small step to, to make some changes in here, some of them are good, some of them are bad, um, but at the end of the day, what we really need to do is re-examine the entire process because having been through it with two school systems, it's, it's very damaging to a community, it's very difficult to deal with, and it automatically removes the focus from the schools and the kids and puts it on the politicians and the board. And that's not where that focus needs to be. So we're going to engage in a much broader discussion over, uh, over the next year or so. And I look forward to working with the governor's office. We've already begun the discussion. I look forward to working with my other colleagues in the Senate um, and, and, and in the House to re-examine and, and to analyze this law. Because right now, it is not uh, a situation that makes good sense. Um, and, and so I would just commend you all to, to a, a robust discussion of how we should handle these issues because the way we have it now, it's, it's, it's broken. Thank you, Mr. President. If there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, yield. Chair, you wish to ex accept questions. Sure. Chair, recognize Senator 35th. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? I'll yield. Uh, is, isn't it true that uh, Section 2 of this, this bill it's a good portion of the bill that helps those students who through no fault of their own may find themselves in a situation where the accreditation is, is uh, gone and they have worked hard to uh, get scholarships and to uh, finish school and this will just allow them to um, be able to use the HOPE scholarship? A absolutely, and I, and I intend to vote for the bill essentially because of that mm -hmm. section. And isn't it true that it's my bill that got put on as uh, all of Section 2? I, I know that, that you have been working on this for, for a long, long time. Yes, I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair, recognize Senator from 35th for a question. Uh, excuse me, 37th. Does Senator yield? I yield. Senator, I want to applaud your passion for public education. But I would like Thank to you. ask you, is it not the case historically when school boards and school s systems have been threatened with lack of accreditation, is it not because of the actions of those who are on the board, not who they are, but what they have done? I don't believe that, I don't know of any movement against a board's accreditation has been for anything other 
than the actions of those who are on the Board of Education. So to think that you could exercise this vehicle without it affecting those who are on the board as a result of their actions, I don't quite understand how that would work. Would you please explain that? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and I likewise applaud your commitment and your service on the boards of education that you served on. My point is this. Sometimes removal may be the appropriate outcome. And, 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 and I think, as I said, and I've been public about, about the, the handling of the DeKalb County situation, but, but at the same time, if we don't have a broader set of, of um, opportunities and options for the governor, then all he's got, he or she, is, is removal. And, and, and so I think that if we have a broader set and a much broader discussion about what the options are, how you can handle a board, how you can require certain a actions from a board, how you can appoint a monitor, et cetera, et cetera, or even a recall election, um, you could do that and have removal as a last resort. But the current legislation doesn't allow any discussion about what the governor can or should do with respect to the board other than removal. That's my only point, Mr. Chairman. Would the senator further yield? I'll yield. Is it not so that when the board of when the state board of education brings this into a hearing, they would take into consideration uh, student achievement and see how it may be negatively affected by the actions of the board? I don't believe the hands are tied of the state board of education to counsel and work with the local board. I think. I think a recommendation to the governor would absolutely be the last step based on their recommendation if, if a proper solution could be derived. The State Board of Education has that authority and even the governor has that authority. He doesn't have to remove that board. He could negotiate a settlement with them. It is true that he doesn't have to remove the board, but the only standard in the law is whether or not the board's presence will help or, 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 or hurt the accreditation process. So there is no ability to analyze anything else other than ha the, the, the presence of these board members and their uh, impact on accreditation. And I think that's a fair limited if you're going to talk about removal, but it would be good, I think, to have express options out there. And again, I, I, I'm looking forward to this discussion and we'll We'll put this uh, bill out in the next day or two that expands uh, the menu of options uh, that the board can have and the ex expands the types of discussions that can occur because right now the state board is only allowed to consider yes or no on removal. There, there's not the, the broad set, of, at least under the current law, there's not a broad set of options for them. But, but I'll, I'll look again, I, I, I'm, I'm going to vote yes on this bill, um, but I, I, I just want to, to be sure that we're having this type of discussion and I look forward to doing it and I know that, that, that you will be committed to getting it right. So no further questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the well. Chair recognize Senator Vellum 39th to uh, speak to the bill. Mr. President, members of the Senate, I rise to commend uh, Amendment Number One to you. Uh, this is a very simple amendment, <clears throat> but it gets to the core issues, some of which have been discussed this morning already regarding accreditation. <clears throat> Whether you agree with SACS and what they have done or have not done, uh, one of the issues that has concerned me and concerned a, a great number of people is that SACS not only is it a crediting firm, if a school system loses accreditation, they are the firm that offers remediation. Um, that is, if they take away your accreditation or even if they put you on probation, they're the agency, they're the company that does what? That tells you how to get back on to get your accreditation. They not only tell you how to get your accreditation back, they work with you and counsel with you and advise you, and then they give you a bill. They charge for those fees. It seems to me and seems to many other people that there is a conflict of interest involved. There is a conflict of interest when SACS can take away your accreditation and then demand that you use them to get it back and charge you a fee and send you a bill. That is, I think, to 
uh, to my way of thinking, the very definition of a conflict of interest. Presently, it is my understanding that the state, through the State Board of Education, enters into a memo of understanding with SACS on accreditation. Um, you might ask, well then, how could, what, what would happen if this was to pass? The State Board of Education, the State Board of Education would have to find another agency, enter, enter into an agreement with another agency to provide those services so that the local school system could come back under accreditation. Um, you know, we could have a debate all day long about whether you like SACs or don't like SACs or whether they're fair or unfair, but this amendment doesn't get to that issue. What it gets to is whether or not we're going to allow the people who uh, put, can take you out of compliance to be the ones who say, this is how you get back into compliance and here's the bill for it. One could argue that there's an economic incentive on the part of, the, of SACs to take away the accreditation in order to get the business. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but you could argue that point. We need to make sure that there is no conflict of interest, and therefore I commend this amendment to you and ask you to vote for it. Uh, Mr. President, I'll yield the well unless there are questions. I'd be glad to take any and all questions from my colleagues. Chair, and I, Senator 37th, Distinguished Education Chairman, for a question. Senator, do you yield? Yes, sir. Would it be unfair to say that a doctor who diagnoses an illness would be precluded from treating that illness to restore the health of the patient? I think someone's going to have to work through the process to preserve it, and I, don't, I have not seen any evidence that, stacks, that Sachs has abused their ability to work in public schools. I speak against your amendment. Well, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, when you go to the doctor and he finds a problem, he sends you to a specialist. Uh, what I think needs to happen is, thank you, Mr. President. I think what needs to happen here is there needs to be a specialist, and that specialist doesn't need to be sacked. I think we need to, and uh, you know, and I, I agree with you, Senator, that uh, if when you say, or I agree that you believe when you say that you have not seen any evidence of any conflict of interest. But as we know in our recent discussion of the ethics bill, we should do what? We should do away with even the appearance, even the appearance, the perception of a conflict of interest. No further questions, Senator. Thank you. Chair, I I, Senator Member 26, for speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, and ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. My concern is when we are cutting public education and local board members who have the right to do the assessment on property tax or to raise the millage rate, there's a concern in a lot of communities where the citizens then are mad with the Board of Education and then start a campaign saying that the board is not doing what it needs to do, and therefore it becomes a political issue. But one of the main things that, that I think we need to look at is that most, the majority of the school boards are elected. When you remove them, when the governor removes and appoints somebody else, these folks were duly elected, then it flies in the face of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And my question is, what are you going to do to remedy the other situations where if the governor appoints a member to the, that local board of education where that member was elected and therefore you're going to put an appointed member into an elected position? You know, what we have in law right now, if there's a vacancy created by a member on the board of education, there's a process by which they are elected. Under this process, the governor appoints. Therefore, it flies in the face of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. I think many of the problems we are creating, we did it in Macon, Georgia. We got rid of a good superintendent because folks didn't like the programs he put in place. 
And I think what we need to do is understand what has happened. As I read in the paper the other day, that under the tax equalization, when their county gets $43 million, and the little school system don't get anything. And they, the superintendents now are questioning how does when they kind of get 43 million when they don't get anything because they don't have the tax base to tax to bring in money. So I think the bill inherently has some problems. And I think one of the biggest problems is whether or not you remove a board member, what procedures will you replace with other than appointment by the governor? Uh, Mr. President, if there are no questions, I, I uh, will yield away. There is a question by your friendly colleague, Senator from the 33rd. Senator Yale. Yes. Senator, is there not a provision and process within law right now to remove uh, school board members just as any other elected officials are removed? And isn't it, isn't it true it's called recall? Well, that, that, that is true, but either there's a criminal, there's a criminal part by removal of malfeasance's office, but what? But the, the, for the you. Yes. But what I'm asking you, isn't it true that the public, and, they, and I'm not saying they have heretofore, yeah. but that the public has a way to recall any elected official if they so choose? That is correct. Again, I, I say to you, the problem is, you fly in the, in the face of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act when you take elected members, suspend them, and appoint somebody into that elected position. Uh, Mr. President, uh, there are no further questions I would yield away. Questions on the adoption of the floor amendment. Is there objection? There is objection on the floor amendment offered by the senator from the 39th. It's been uh, uh, debated on the floor. All of those, you wish the A's and nays? A's and nays. All of those in favor of Amendment 1 authored by the senator from the 39th will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Chair recognize Senator from the 37th. Parliamentary question. State your inquiry. Isn't it true that the maker of the bill would, would ask you to vote against this amendment? The, I think the Senator has been very clear on his position. Chair recognize Senator 39th. Uh, Mr. President, shouldn't we fight against a monopoly owned by uh, Sachs in this instance? I hadn't played monopoly in a long time, Senator. Uh, it's a fun game, um, but if we want to adjourn, I'm more than happy to engage in it. I'm not actually, yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> it sounds like I've got a, uh, not just a second, but about a 50 others that are willing to join in. On the adoption of the floor amendment, the yeas are 15, the nays are 35, and the amendment has lost overwhelmingly, I mean overwhelmingly. The question now is on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection? Without objection, the committee substitute is adopted. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to agreeing to the Porter Committee which failed to pass the bill? Chairs none, Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none and the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? The question is on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. The secretary will unlock the machine.
On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 44 and the nays are 6. And this bill, MC Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore passed. <laughs> Secretary will read H.R. 4. House Resolution 4 by Representative Geisinger of the 48th and others. A resolution proposing a settlement of the boundary dispute between the state of Georgia and the state of Tennessee and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Judiciary recommends that this resolution do pass. Amendment 1. Senator Schaefer of the 48th offers the following amendment. Amend H.R. 4 by striking the current boundary between the two states reflecting on line 17, by striking the period at the end of line 35 and inserting in lieu thereof and, and by inserting the following after thir line 35. Whereas the General Assembly of the State of Georgia desires to settle the potential litigation with the State of Tennessee and for other purposes. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognize Senator in the 48th. Distinguished President Pro Tem, please give him your attention. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, House Resolution 4 proposes a resolution to a dispute as old as the nation itself. The 35th parallel of north latitude is the northern border of Georgia. It was the northern border of Georgia when the state of Georgia joined the first, thir first uh, 12 states in forming the United States of America. It was the southern border of North Carolina when it joined with Georgia and those 11 other states and formed the United States of America. And it became the southern border of Tennessee when Tennessee was carved out of North Carolina. I won't recall, uh, recount for you all of the, the details, uh, the 200-year history of this dispute, but suffice it to say in 1817, a erroneous survey was conducted mismarking the uh, boundary between uh, our two states at a location other than the 35th parallel. This erroneous survey was never ratified by the United States Congress, as would be required to change the boundaries of states. It was never ratified by the Georgia General Assembly. In fact, if you open up the code book and look at the uh, boundaries of this state, you will read that we today uh, define and maintain the 35th parallel as our northern border. This state, uh, the, the United States Court of Appeals, and even the state of Tennessee have all acknowledged repeatedly over the last uh, 200 years that the 1817 uh, survey is wrong and that, the, uh, that even the boundary that some believe uh, is the boundary today doesn't match the details of that 1817 survey. What House Resolution uh, 4 does is uh, propose a a uh, solution to this uh, controversy by uh, ceding um, some of the disputed area uh, to Tennessee in return for them acknowledging our claim to uh, sufficient area for us to establish our rights to the uh, riparian rights to the Tennessee River, rights that were guaranteed to us in 1803 uh, when we entered into a compact with the United States of America to cede them the, the territories of Georgia that now form the states of Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, the amendment before you, which I've, been, uh, which I've offered in consultation with the senator from the 54th, makes clear that in proposing this settlement that we are not abandoning our claim to the entire area all the way to the 35th parallel of northern latitude, and it uh, also directs uh, the attorney general of this state uh, to commence uh, litigation for that entire area if they do not accept uh, this offer and settlement before the end of our session in 2014. I, uh, I, I uh, sponsored uh, a resolution, a joint resolution, which was passed by both uh, chambers of the uh, General Assembly and signed into law by Governor Perdue uh, five years ago, asserting our, uh, reasserting our claims. Every member of the body at that time co-sponsored the resolution, and we received a unanimous vote for that, and I ask your unanimous consideration of this resolution today. And if there are no questions, I will yield the well. There are uh, some questions, however. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to stand at ease for our lunch break um, and then come back and finish up this bill. So uh, the Senate will reconvene at 1 o'clock. <laughs>